Please be seated. Because they know that Jesus' cousin John has just been arrested. If that foursome had said no to the call from Jesus, would they have centered their lives and each decision in it on love, healing, and welcome? Perhaps. Perhaps not. Against all odds, though, when this stranger approaches them at the dock in the evening and asks them to completely upend their lives, they say yes. Who lives in the fourth cottage? Do we? Well, like those disciples, we're ordinary. We're rural people, rural people. Or not so marginalized, except sometimes in our imaginations, because who doesn't like to play the victim? But we can feed and clothe ourselves. We live daily protected by the rule of law and by a state apparatus which is at peace. On all days, we live in such safety. If Jesus knocked on our door, if Jesus came to our door, if Jesus invited us to upend our lives with love and healing and welcome, would we be able to say yes? Christians over the years and around the world ponder that question. And I think they, we always like to say, yeah, of course we would. But the trick with the call is that it doesn't come in that nice packaged way after much reflection and plenty of time to decide. The call comes in the middle of our daily lives and it comes as a complete surprise from an unexpected direction and often contains shocking and difficult content and invariably invites us to risk much more than we feel comfortable. Ida Strange was taken out of a forested suburb in Honoring in 1942 with other Jews of Lithuania. In years past, she had picnicked with her family in this forest and climbed its trees. Ida and the others who were lined up over pits and shot fell conveniently into those pits dead. It was a pretty easy way to execute many people. She was so scared when the shooting started that she just fell into the pit before she was shot and she lay still as body upon body fell on top of her throughout the day. A soldier walked over her and all the other bodies when the pit was filled up, shooting down into the pile just to make sure, and Ida was shot to the hand. But she was able to stay still. And then earth 
was thrown over the pit to bury him. In all, almost 100,000 persons ended their lives in the pits of the Panari Forest between 1941 and 1944. Every single Jew in Vilnius, many Soviet prisoners of war, and other political prisoners were systematically shot day after day after day. And slave laborers on the final day were ordered to dig up and burn all of the buried bodies to attempt to hide what had happened at the end of the war. They were unsuccessful, and 11 of them actually escaped with their lives. Ida dug her way out of that pit in the night. She was naked, covered only with mud and blood. She walked away, and when she came to a cottage, she knocked on the door. She was turned away. She went to a second cottage and knocked on the door, and she was turned away. She went bravely to a third cottage, and the same thing happened. She knocked on the door of a fourth cottage, and they opened the door and welcomed her in, and Ida survived the war. We don't know the names of that family who lived in the fourth cottage. We don't know who lives in the fourth cottage. We do know that there, at that time, was absolutely no rule of law in Lithuania that would in any way encourage them to rescue the lost or seek justice for her. In fact, there was no Lithuania in 1942. The state had been completely destroyed. There was only the rule of war. And the rule of war meant that anyone helping anyone else could be shot on sight. There would have been no familial, neighborly, or ethnic connection to encourage such moral actions by those folks in that fourth cottage. For Jews at the time were ethnic pariahs. Who is it that acts with such mercy? In the absence of any support from norms or institutions, government, army, or church. It turns out that most people, most of the time, shut the door when Ida knocks. In fact, what's probably most surprising about this story is that it only took four door knockings before someone let her in. Most people, most of the time, say no when Jesus comes knocking in their lives. What was it that caused the disciples to say yes? What was it that caused the inhabitants of that fourth cottage to say yes? What might cause any one of us to say yes? There's some interesting research, interesting to me, coming out of World War II that suggests that those who are recorded as making acts such as opening the door when Jesus knocked in his guise as an unclothed, dirty, bloody teenage girl, were those who themselves had experienced some degree of marginalization in the years leading up before the war. In sociological terms, they were Poles who were living in Ukraine. They were Ukrainians living in Belarus. Among Christian groups, they might have been Unites in Orthodox lands or Protestants in Catholic lands. Like those Jewish peasants of Roman Palestine in the first century, they had experience being on the other side of that same door. They had practice in acting ethically without any institution to buttress their moral choices. 
No one was watching to commend them for doing the right thing. Who lives in the fourth cottage? Well, if we play the odds, it could be any of us. Any one of us at any time might say yes when Jesus comes knocking. Any one of us might accept a call to completely upend our lives and leave our comfortable world behind. But you know this is a sermon. And sermons never suggest that we rely on chance. We want to weight the dice to come out in God's favor. But if we follow some of that World War II social science research, we might find ourselves more likely to open the door and say yes if we ourselves have experienced identity-threatening marginalization. And we find, according to the research, that it is our very heartbroken wounds and traumas that have the power to build spiritual bridges that span a chasm between us and saying yes to the call of Christ. And following centuries of Christian spiritual practice, we will find ourselves more likely to open the door and say yes if we are daily steeped in Bible and in prayer, rather than simply tossed among the seas, hypnotic followers of contemporary politics and culture, whatever it might be. Ironically, it is our little daily spiritual practice, holy reading, reflective time that strengthens our moral muscular commitment and gives us the power to say yes to the unexpected presence and call of Christ. And lest this sound perhaps just a little too much, like we are expected to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps morally, in order to be able to say the hard yes, let me remind you that there is also grace and God's power working in the world to strengthen the weak arms and feeble knees. Who lives in the fourth cottage? I hope we all can say we do.